A terrorist hijacking inspires an incredible mission. I was very determined when we have to do this. I feel the need to be effective and to defend our people. A young nation is forever changed. As I lost uh, a beloved brother, this was a great shock and uh, undoubtedly affected my life in fundamental ways. With echoes of Nazi Germany. Oh my God, they are to have a small holocaust in this plan. And a daring rescue mission that stuns the world. June 27th, 1976, Air France Flight 139 from Tel Aviv to Paris with 200 passengers aboard makes a scheduled stopover in Athens. Security is lax. The metal detector is unmanned. The X-ray technician inattentive. 56 additional passengers board the plane and it departs for Paris. But two minutes after takeoff, three men and a woman leap to their feet, brandishing guns and grenades. Flight 139 has been hijacked. Captain Michel Bacos, a pilot for 21 years, is confronted with the first hijacking in Air France history. A terrorist. A terrorist had his gun continuously pointed at my head, and occasionally he would poke my neck to remind me not to look at him. We could only obey the orders of the terrorists. Trisha Martel was en route to London for her mother's funeral. Anybody who tried to protest, they would hit them with the butt of the gun or with their hand. You sit, you can't breathe, everything dries up, and all you can think of is, dear God, help me. The hijackers announce that they have commandeered the flight in the name of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the PFLP. They plant explosives along the aisles, search passengers, and collect passports. Their destination is unknown. Ilan Hartu was traveling with his mother, Dora Bloch. We heard a voice uh, with a German accent uh, telling us the whole story that we are, uh, we've changed direction. I was afraid that the German woman, either because she hated us or because uh, she was absent-minded, she would throw the hand grenade and we'd all explode. The 12-man crew and 256 passengers aboard the plane hail from a dozen nations. A babble of languages and the presence of young children adds to the chaos. But to air traffic controllers, Flight 139 falls silent. The loss of radio contact is immediately registered by the electronic ears of Israeli intelligence forces. A message is flashed to Prime Minister Itzhak Rabin. Flight 139, with a large number of Israelis aboard, has either crashed or been hijacked. At Tel Aviv's Lod Airport, military forces go on alert, expecting the plane to return to Israel. At the time, Muki Betzer was deputy commander of an elite Israeli commando force. The practice and the tactic is that as soon as the plane lands on a predetermined runway, we trail it, and just as it stops, we break in through the doors and other areas that we have the means to swiftly break through using special explosives, and we free the hostages. But rather than flying to Israel, the hijackers direct the plane south and land in Benghazi, Libya. Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi allows the plane to refuel, but will not allow it to stay. Hostage Tricia Martel pleads for a doctor and concocts the perfect ploy to be released from the plane. He took my pulse and he said, what's happening? And I said to him, I think I might be miscarrying. I'm four months pregnant and, and um, if I start bleeding here, I'll die because there's no way you'll be able to stop the bleeding. 
So he, he just looked at the uh, terrorists and he said to them, we better get her off the plane. Martel's clever ruse works. She is flown via Libyan Airlines to London and is debriefed there by Scotland Yard. She provides the outside world its first information on the terrorists, two Arab men and a German couple. The Germans are identified as Gabriel Kroch Tiedemann and Wilfred Bose. They are terrorists for hire from the notorious Bader Meinhof gang. Aboard Flight 139, the passengers endure seven tense hours in the steaming cabin. When the plane finally lifts off from Libya, everyone speculates on the next destination. Will it be Damascus, Baghdad, Beirut? To everyone's surprise, they head instead to the Central African nation of Uganda. Uganda, Uganda! The terrorists are greeted at Entebbe Airport by Ugandan dictator Idi Amin Dada. It is estimated that Amin may have killed over 300,000 countrymen while taking over Uganda. With five wives and as many as 18 children, Amin is known in the West as Big Daddy. He is also known to be suffering from advanced syphilis and prone to that disease's irrational behavior. For years, Amin had allied himself with Israel, but in 1972, the Israeli government refused to provide him with high-performance jets that he wanted to use to attack neighboring Tanzania. His pride stung, Amin severed relations with Israel and embraced the Palestinian cause. After the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, Palestinian groups resorted to terrorism to regain the land they claimed as their own. In 1972, Palestinian-sponsored terror escalated to new heights of violence. May 15th, 28 civilians gunned down at Lod Airport. May 30th, 22 children killed in a school bombing in Ma'alot, Israel. And September 5th, 11 Israeli athletes slaughtered at the Summer Olympics in Munich. At Munich, the Israeli government held on to its long-standing policy of not negotiating with terrorists. But the disastrous results of the botched hostage rescue by German security forces caused many Israelis to question their government's actions. Still haunted by the Olympic disaster, Israeli leaders dreaded a repeat at Entebbe. Midday Monday, the hijackers herd 256 passengers and 12 crew members into the airport's old terminal building. The four terrorists from the plane are joined by six other Palestinians already in Uganda. Hostage Sarah Davidson and her family were traveling to the United States as a special bar mitzvah present for her son, Benny. The worst of, the, of all was that my children are taken away from me. You can't imagine. It's, it's a feeling that you can't even describe.